Good afternoon, good morning, or good evening, depending on where you are joining us from today. Welcome to the webinar, Climate Change and Frontline Communities, the third webinar in the series, Climate and Community of Faithful Action for Climate Justice. My name is Amy Hong, and I serve as a Senior Executive Director of Education and Engagement at the General Board of Church and Society in Washington, DC. For participants who are blind or low vision, or perhaps only listening, I'm a Korean American woman with shoulder length black hair tied back, wearing a black sweater joining you today from DC. I will be moderating this webinar with my colleague, Reverend Katie Monforte. A few of Church and Society staff attended COP26 in Scotland last month and had an opportunity to meet with Climate Justice for All. Climate Justice for All is a climate focused, youth led, global campaign that seeks to mobilize the Methodist family on issues of climate justice. We were very lucky to have our staff ask them a few questions. Here is a video of their response. Hi, I'm Molly and I'm from Newcastle, which is in the northeast of England. And um, I'm in really passionate about climate justice because I really think that um, as Christians, um, I think one of the most important things that we can do is um, love and protect all of the things that God created, and protecting the earth is really important because God created it, but it also, it's also really important because that what allow, that's, it's what allows all of us, all of these people, all of life, all of the animals, all of those things to survive as well. So we, can't, we really can't neglect that because um, we, can't live, we can't live on an earth that um, is yeah, burning and kind of destructing, be, being, um, yeah, just, I think, so I think, I think that's really important. So from a kind of like respect to the creative perspective, but also a respect um, as well. And people to, and, and respect to the planet as well, I think that's really, really important. Um, so yeah, th that's what's, I think that's why climate justice is really, really important to me. Um, and I also really think that it's really important for the church to be at the forefront of these movements, because I think um, it speaks so powerfully when the church can be the leader on um, social justice issues, because I think my experience of the church has always been that um, we speak and um, we're able to demonstrate the love and kind of works of Jesus when we um, we are speaking out against injustice. So being at the forefront of the climate movement is really important. And what gives me hope for the future of kind of like the climate justice movement is um, I've always been really inspired by um, the um, the voice and the the kind of boldness of young people in speaking out against injustice. But what I've been really struck by over the kind of the course of my job is how willing um, the rest of the church are to listen and to kind of learn and grow together. And that is, I think, really important because I don't think um, movements within the church work without the intergenerational working because everyone can contribute different things. So I've give I've been given hope that. Um, we can that this can be an intergenerational movement and that conversations can happen between generations and that hopefully that gets to a point where as i sort of said the church can be the, the be the leaders and model the kind of um listening and working and all of that kind of stuff that we want to see our global leaders um, do as well A short overview of our time together. After the lecture, there will be a time of Q&A led by Reverend Katie Monforte. So please enter your questions in the Q&A box located at the bottom of your screen, and we will end with closing announcements. 
I am honored to introduce you to our speaker for today. Um, Dr. Gregory Jenkins is a Philadelphia native and a professor in the Department of Meteorology and Atmospheric Science with affiliate appointments in African Studies and Geography at Penn State University. He is also the director of the Alliance for Education, Sciences, Engineering, and Design with Africa in the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences. Previously, he was the director of Howard University Program in Atmospheric Sciences and chaired the Department of Physics and Astronomy at Howard University. A recipient of the National Science Foundation Career Award, he was also selected as a Fulbright Senior Research Fellow in 2003 and 2004. Dr. Jenkins has taken part in the NASA African Monsoon Multidisciplinary Analysis Field Campaign in Cape Verde and Senegal. He has published in numerous journals and is a recipient of the 2007 Alumni Merit Award from the Atmospheric, Oceanic, and Space Sciences Engineering Department at the University of Michigan. He is a member of History Makers, was named a fellow of the American Meteorological Society, and has been the recipient of the Charles E. Anderson Award. His areas of research are in weather, climate, and air quality of West Africa. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Jenkins. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, well, in the next 30 minutes or so, I'm going to give you an overview of the climate justice work that is still to be done, in my opinion. I might say that um, when I think about front lines, I think about uh, growing up in Philadelphia on a front line and uh, really lots of health disparities and poverty. And the work that I've been doing in, in, on the continent has also kind of looked at frontline communities. So I kind of feel like I'm a little bit displaced at a university because I feel like frontline issues are the thing that drives me every day in, in my way of thinking. Um, and trying to figure out how to serve uh, frontline communities now and in the future is what I'm really hopeful for. So if I could begin the uh, PowerPoint to give you an idea, give you some, some views of this, I would uh, love to do it. Okay, well, let me get started here and let me go to uh, full screen mode. And uh, this picture is from, I live in Harrisburg and Harrisburg, in my opinion, has a lot of social ills in terms of the kind of segregation that exists. But this picture here reconnects me back to the continent, but it also half of it kind of looks like the present. And it's a beautiful picture. And, uh, and it, 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 it has me always thinking like, what is she thinking about? Because I'm always like, what am I thinking about? <laughs> so I wanna just bring you to take away the key takeaway points up front that climate justice extends beyond climate change. And this is a struggle that many of my colleagues don't actually understand that it's more than looking at model data for me. Um, it's a justice issue. And it has historical present and future narratives. And these are gonna play out and we're all part of the actors in terms of how the narratives play out. And frontline communities come in many forms, but they expand with climate injustice. And we'll talk about that in a second. And then, we need more than climate solutions, which me and my colleagues are often talking about. We need climate justice solutions. And those are different than what is often presented in academic environments. So I always start out with, sorry, with this picture because I have to. I teach a freshman seminar, I teach a climate course, and I tell them that we're all connected because, uh, we're all born in a time of environmental change. So I'd love to show this because when I'm talking to the public, they don't understand what the CO2 thing is all about. But this chart here goes back to January of 1979. Many people have seen this, but what it shows us is how carbon dioxide is increasing over time. And many of us were born, as I say, the younger generation, 
you know, born after 1979. So when I show this to freshmen, they see that they're part of something that has been going on for quite some time and is continuing. So this represents CO2 concentrations between 90 North and 90 South. And it's the annual kind of increases that we're seeing over time. And I might tell you that maybe when I was born, the amount was 315 parts per million. But this clock on the right shows a value in 1997, for example. And many of my students are born around 2000. And I tell them that you were born into something that was changing and you just weren't aware of it. But this change in greenhouse gas, this CO2 is global and it's impacting the entire planet, not just each of us as individuals. And then somehow we have a challenge of trying to stop this or at least slow it down. And if we were in my class, I'd explain to them that we see more variability in the North than in the South because the South has more ocean and the atmosphere reacts more quickly to the land surface in the Northern hemisphere. But the, the, the remarkable part about this is that we're driving this curve. This is not a natural curve. It is something that humans have created. So, you know, when we go back further in time, we know, in fact, that here on the right, that CO2 concentrations were lower in the past. Uh, the, 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 the initial record started in 1958, Dr. Keeling um, in Hawaii. But our record takes us back even further. And we have colleagues in my departments, they look at proxy data, and they can decide and determine what CO2 concentrations were like. And then they go even back further. We have great scientists like Richard Alley. He goes to Greenland or to the Antarctic. And they tell us that the, the kind of glacial, interglacial range of CO2 is between 180 and 280 parts per million. And today we're at 420 parts per million. So we know that this is not a natural signal that we're currently in. And it's happening very rapidly, which is the part that worries us. We know that between uh, glacial periods, the value at a glacial, in a glacial period, the CO2 is lower, around 180 parts per million. And then when you come out of it, it's 280 parts per million. But that was prior to human beings having civilizations where they're generating lots of CO2. Now, the real part is, is our planet warming? And again, I really try to tell folks that this is an anomaly map and it tells us how temperatures have changed over the last 150 years. And if it's blue, it means it's cooler than 1951 to 80. And if it's warmer, then it's gonna be in a yellow or orange color. And what we know is that as we've gone through the end of the 20th century up into present, that the planet has warmed everywhere. Very few places are not seeing warming. And the polar regions, the Arctic region has undergone the largest changes. And we know that life in the Arctic, life, whether it's humans or natural, are being impacted in a very big way because that's where the warming is the greatest. Even though we don't live there, it is our job to think about other locations around the world where people are being impacted. Now, as a scientist, every few years we get these IPCC reports, which include lots of peer reviewed literature to talk about how the climate system is changing. And we look at these and we've been assessing the climate for 30 years. And I just wanna say that each one, the language is stronger. So the earlier quotes were more or less non-political at all. That people didn't want to, just scientists kind of wanted to stay back and say, well, there are lots of uncertainties. But the last report shows that the human influence is unequivocal and it's warmed. So we don't even talk about if it has, we know it has. The data is telling us that. The widespread changes have occurred in oceans, in the cryosphere, and in the biosphere, and they're rapid. And we're not able to account for all of the changes, especially in the biosphere. And that 
the influence of humans, the way it's warmed the climate is unprecedented in the last 2000 years. So this is a hundred generations. And so we have to really think about what this means. And when we look at the reconstructed temperature record, this gray area here is where we should be concerned because it has happened so fast. The CO2 has gone up fast and the warming has gone up fast. And this is very problematic. And when we think about the future, we run climate models and they tell us, give us a sense of what to expect. Here, this is what the observe, we're about 1.1 degrees C warmer than pre-industrial times. So this is what the observations look like. And our best tools, our climate models, simulate something that looks kind of like reality. Of course, it's not fully reality. The main point is, is that we get to the point, these issues around 1.5. So we know there's a so-called dangerous climate change when temperatures are around two. And the idea has been to hold temperatures to no more than 1.5 degrees C relative to the 1850s. I think this is almost impossible to do. It will take a big Herculean lift to make this happen. We don't currently have the policies in place to make it happen globally. But the point here is that this is how the planet changes. As we get out to four degrees C, these are scenarios that we don't want to see for our grandchildren and our great grandchildren. We need to have a planet that looks relatively similar to the present. And what the, the, the recent report shows is that the extremes, the heat extremes have increased in most of the world. So these, these designations are like MED is Mediterranean and WNA is Western North America, WAF is West Africa, but the planet is warming and the extremes are what we know least about, but have the biggest impact on human systems and also on infrastructure. But basically this tells us that the planet is warming. And we also see that drought is increasing. So these are the extremes that we don't really know a whole lot about how it starts or how it ends, but we know that these trends are happening. So Western North America has been in a very long drought, but so have many parts of Africa and Australia and the Mediterranean. So this is where we say we're seeing something global. And further, the last report shows that as we continue to warm the climate, we should expect the frequency of droughts to increase. So right now, there's about a 1.7 times greater chance of a drought in 10 years than it was in the 1850s to 1900. As we warm the system, we expect the frequency to increase. And we also expect the intensity to increase. Now rainfall, for those of you who dealt with Hurricane Ida, if you live in New York or Philadelphia, or if you're in Africa, we know the heavy rainfall events are increasing and they're causing havoc. We do not know the extent of the havoc, but we know that they are increasing. If it's in North America, Africa, or Europe, we see this trend and it's happening on time scales which are decadal. So for example, West Africa was much drier in the 80s and now we've shifted off to a very wet kind of extreme condition in much of West Africa. And the final point here is that as we warm the climate, we expect the frequency of heavy rainfall events to increase and the intensity to increase. Then these are warning signs for us about what future generations are gonna have to deal with. So one immediately, people always ask me about precipitation. And I say, look, as the, the planet warms, our planet is 70% ocean. We get greater evaporation. In addition, the atmosphere is able to hold more moisture as it warms. 
And then it manifests itself, whether it's thunderstorms or hurricanes. And this is what we're seeing. I mean, it's very rapid. And I don't think that we were prepared. So I feel like we're ahead of the curve in terms of climate change. So let me move forward. This is the last one. And this one is inevitable. So even if we were to stop, you know, all the warming at present, the cryosphere or the large ice sheets in, our, in the Arctic and the Antarctic have different time scales. They normally work on tens of thousands of years. So once an ice sheet starts to become destabilized and decay, you can't really put it back. It's like dominoes or it's like Humpty Dumpty, right? You can't really put it back. So when this comes out, when the, and we know it's happening, it's going to continue over time. So if you come back to the planet 200 years from now, or if your future great, great, great grandkid was able to write you a letter, they would tell you that some of the beaches that you currently go to no longer exist. That they see your pictures, but they are, they're, those beaches are no longer there. The house that was there is no longer there. It's been moved. Everyone's moved inward. And that is inevitable. Now, if we don't act in terms of mitigating, we should expect two to as many as 10, seven, five meters of sea level rise. In simple terms, that's 10 to 15 feet of sea level rise. So we actually have to act on behalf of those who are not yet born. And that's a reality. Now, let me jump to this issue of climate justice. Because we all have, well, there are definitions of climate justice, but my definition of climate justice has been emerging over time as a scientist and as a human being. So for me, climate justice is this intersection of climate change, social justice, and environmental justice. And it's manifested in this picture. And we were at the People's uh, Climate March in New York. And these students were there. Now you might notice, okay, what happened was this march had, I don't know, 100,000 people. At one point they stopped the entire march and they said, let's give two minutes of silence for the earth because of what humans are doing to it. But these students, if you notice them, they have their hands up. And the hands up posture is hands up, don't shoot because uh, there was a killing earlier in the year by the police. And these are also students who have been fighting environmental justice in their communities. And so this picture is what, to me, it brings it all together. We're out there marching for climate change, we're marching for social justice, and we're marching for environmental justice. And environmental justice, I'll come back to it in a few minutes. So frontline communities are being exacerbated through climate injustice. In today's front lines, we see floods like these recent ones in, in Germany or in Tennessee or where I work in Senegal. Uh, let me see. Boy, fine, 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 go fee. Ah, me, me. Boy, fine, fine. So people wake up and it's flooding. They don't know what happened. Or this one, which is related. So the infrastructures that people live in from flooding is real and it's happening. And I might say that uh, here's Cape Verde. I get my phone lights up. People send me WhatsApp messages saying what's going on. Some of these we can predict in Africa. Most we do not have the ability to do so we do not have the infrastructure 
that you might find in the United States. People aren't going to get a warning from the National Weather Service. They're just going to be in the midst of it trying to survive. So this is another form of climate injustice. Fine, fine, fine. We see the front lines in the US around wildfires. Now, so people are exposed to hazards. And so new front lines are happening and we're witnessing them. We may not be paying attention, but if you live in California, you would know that the wildfire season is not only becoming more extensive in terms of time, but space-wise, we're seeing larger areas that are burning. And part of this is due to drying, less snow, warmer winters, and all the above. In, in the case of very extreme events like hurricanes, like this is 2020, we've never seen so many hurricanes in the Atlantic in one season. And it's just like amazing for someone who follows this, that the devastation was happening in front of our eyes. The one on the right, this picture here is, this is from Hurricane Ida this summer, making landfall, causing all kinds of habit. Most of the times we're looking at urban areas to say the hurricane did this, but this hurricane did extensive damage also. We had Katrina 15 years ago, this, this uh, Hurricane Ida probably had $60 billion of damage not only in Louisiana, but all the way through, up through New York City. But now let me pull you back because many people, Black, people of color, indigenous, the global South have been living on front lines for five centuries. So this is not actually new. This is just a continuation. It takes on a different form, okay? We're now talking about climate change, but the social injustices, the environmental injustices have been going on for quite some time. And if you think about this, where I go to school, Penn State, the area was inhabited by the Susquehanna nation, okay, tribe. And these were all of the nations if you look back in the 1700s. But today, we don't find those nations or those tribes. They're confined to very small regions. Not only are they more susceptible and more vulnerable to climate change, but their way of life is over as they knew it for many, many hundreds or thousands of years. So the adjustment is very difficult. And then we all know this is Africa today. When we look at it, we see all these different nations. But this is not really Africa. Sorry, this is Africa. Africa is a diaspora and it was created by human beings hundreds of years ago. So I love going to this because not everyone sees it, but they need to. And let me make sure I'm sharing the screen correctly. So this is an animation that goes back to the 1500s of ship, ships that were going across the Atlantic. Now, let's be clear that this was a business. Not only did it help America develop, but it created wealth on the backs of people. It destabilized Africa, no doubt about it in the worst kind of way. And there were many actors. So if I can find my mouse and, and pause this, all of these are ships going across the Atlantic carrying people. Here's my mouse. So let's just pause this in 1667. If I click it, you will see that there are ships here. Here's another. Here's another, and typically they will keep say which country the flag, which the ship was flying a certain kind of flag. So let me stop again. So this is the Netherlands. Here is a British ship, they're flying their flag. Here's another ship. And they're telling you that the, the number of people who were on that ship during the voyage. 
Now, what amazes me is that people talk about the age of enlightenment in Europe and in America, et cetera. And I feel like this is the age of enlightenment because what we're doing is trying to understand what happened. We're reconstructing our past. I, it just amazes me that we talk about independence uh, on the 4th of July and so many people were being enslaved at the time of the writing of the document. And in some places like Brazil, the end of slavery happened in the late 1800s. Now the, the constitution says that inter to transatlantic slavery will come to an end in 1808. That's what it says. But it really never came to an end in 1808. And in fact, it just shifted forms. Uh, in the US, the movement of people was around the states. It didn't end slavery, it just said there would not be any further taking of people from the continent. The British also had it. And I think the British probably lived up to the end of transatlantic slavery more than others. Uh, but clearly it didn't end. And uh, the Portuguese and the Spanish, maybe not the French, they ended the practice. But all of these are ships that continue to leave the continent moving human beings. So I just want to stop it right at the end because it's also instructive to know about these last ships in the 1850s. British ship, they ended, but there's still flags flying. And American ships, which are typically carrying people to Cuba, present day Cuba. Now this is, you know, just a few years before the civil war. And yet the ships were still moving out there. Big ships, by the way, moving people. So it really brings into question the, the hypocrisy that's tied to this institution. Okay, let me stop that and let me go back. But the reality is, is that when I look at my own ancestry, I don't know where I come from per se, because people were taken from the coast of Senegal down to Namibia, some of my ancestors. Uh, but I do know, for example, now that my mother's line goes back to the Fulani in Northern Nigeria. But the point is, this is most of the people that you see in the diaspora that are here. They don't actually know where they emerged from. Their ancestors came from all over. But let's just, and so I might say that when I do my work in Senegal, this is a place, uh, these are places that I've come across in my research. This is James Island. And this is Gore off of Senegal. And before I normally do my work, uh, these are students from Howard. We always go there first because I guess we always felt that we had to pay our respects. Um, and we never really talk uh, when we go into these places. We just hold our peace. And then we do our research after that, uh, understanding that we're all a function of the people who survived that. And then I've gone to Elmina and Ghana, many people have gone here, but for me, Elmina has this like different connotation because it's like the biggest slave fort I've ever seen. And these condemned, these condemned cells, where people who resisted would be forced into so that 
they would starve them to death or make them die of thirst. Um, but for me, these Adinkra symbols from Ghana tell me a different story. Like that, uh, you know, skull and bones, it has a different connotation as an Adinkra symbol, which means die not. So for me, the people, their bodies were gone, but not their spirits. And I might say in the South Atlantic, this is St. Helena, uh, very far off, not a place you think of, but this has a very strange story to it also. <laughs> the British in the 1840s were stopping ships. Most of them had the, were flying the flags of Portugal. And what they did was they, they brought people to St. Helena, took them off the ships. Um, some of them were sent to Jamaica as indentured servants, but they didn't enslave them. But there's something strange on this island, a massive gravesite. This was discovered in 2006 when they were trying to build an airport. And I just happened to stop over here as part of a research trip. But anyway, the ship had to stop there. But I had heard about this. The point was, they were building the airport. They found some bones. They thought it was a wife and a husband. They stopped building. They brought in archaeologists. The archaeologists started digging, saying, hey, something else is going on here. And it's a mass gravesite. No one knows what happened here. But there are some five to 7,000 people in this mass grave site. But there's no storyline to it as to what happened. We do know that most of the people in this grave site were relatively young, meaning they weren't 30s or 40s, but 20s and, and younger. And here's just one of the sites where they were doing the DNA analysis. And they, they put this sign here. Um, about the people who were forced to St. Helena. And then they put them back into a place after the DNA analysis to respect those who, who had been there. And now let me just jump on and tell you that the connection to all of this is really around the Industrial Revolution because the Industrial Revolution needed money. I mean, it wasn't gonna go by itself. So cotton or African labor or taxes were used to drive the system. And it's happened for you know, two, three centuries, whether it was peanuts for peanut oil to drive machinery or palm oil or minerals, and today it's uh, Hershey's chocolate. Okay, cocoa is coming out of Ghana. And, but when you look at the income amounts in Africa, very low, okay? So a minerally rich place so, and, and with many uh, resources, but not making it into the hands of people. And so when I talk to my students, they have this picture of the industrial revolution. And I tell them it's a false one. It's not railroads and trains, but rather, sorry, it's cotton. And cotton is what drove the Industrial Revolution. And if you look back in 1791, there were about 2 million pounds of cotton being produced. But by 1860, just prior to the Civil War, a billion pounds of cotton were being produced. And the US was the largest contributor, and this was largely around torture to increase production by enslaved people. So we know many of our ancestors died in the cotton fields. That's how it turned out. I mean, they worked until they died. This drove the textile factories in Britain, just like the building of slave ships drove uh, shipyards in Liverpool or in Lisbon. So all of this was to drive something that was very diabolical. And we look at this from a social kind of injustice point of view. And today 
we see it still playing out because those CO2 emissions where you have high per capita are the so-called industrialized nations that made their livings off the back of the global south. And yet those who are gonna be impacted the most are in the global south. So they didn't make it, they're just being impacted. This is a, a paradox for Africa where people live in extreme poverty, less than $2 a day and produce very low CO2 emissions. They have to deal with the impacts of climate change. And then so I jump now to say something about social justice, which is why we can't think about climate justice without thinking about social justice. In the United States, it begins so far back from the time people arrive or were captured and arrived. And today it looks like police brutality or mass incarceration or food insecurity or health disparities or redlining. All of this is part of the social injustice kind of background. We are not going to be able to address climate change if we don't deal with these social injustices, because you gotta get people on board. And just quickly jump to environmental justice because that's the kind of third triad of what I call climate justice. You know, the movement began back in the 1970s. This is uh, Reverend Ben Chavis leading the march in Warren County where PCBs were being dumped into black communities. We know EJ looks at this disproportionate impact of air, water, and soil pollution with likely health impacts on Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Whether it's Benton Harbor or whether it's uh, Flint, Michigan, we see the same things. And more recently, there's an EJ component tied to COVID-19 because we now know that the most polluted areas tend to have the greatest severity in terms of uh, COVID um, outcomes. And those polluted communities are highly uh, sectorized around black and brown communities. It could be industrial waste, it could be power plants, highways. These are all playing out there. I know we don't have much time, so I just wanna say that the EJ movement was powerful in itself because they produced these 17 principles. And the 17 principles, I believe, are the way we need to go forward with climate justice. Basic ideas around the sacredness of earth. Um, these are just a few of them. Fundamentals of self-determination, necessitation of environmental threats, the right to work in a safe and healthy environment. That's important during COVID where you're an essential or frontline worker. Um, and issues around education and opposing multinational operations, which often drive EJ issues. So the emerging EJ issues are still around toxic waste and air quality, but now we're talking about air and water and soil pollution near extraction sites and power plants and highways and air quality and plastics and other kinds of waste and water quality. These are the emerging issues. So this is also expanded. Maybe it was always there, but it's currently multi fronts around EJ. And going back, this study really lays it out in 1987 uh, by uh, the United Church of Christ, where they identified in 87, how EJ was playing out. And many people are familiar with this, but it clearly points out that black and brown communities are targeted with toxic waste uh, and other kinds of pollutions that have a negative health impact on these communities. And if we jump to today, we still see this playing out because we know black Americans have highest asthma rates and are more likely to go to emergency wards, 
or more likely to die from asthma. And much of this is tied to the environment or Puerto Rican Americans have twice the asthma and there can be a gender component. We see that in Senegal. Uh, I think I'm gonna skip over this, but this report just came out. And basically this is the global warming of the future in the United States. But what they show is that we're gonna see more asthma, more premature death if for people over 65, and we'll see more childhood asthma as the climate system warms. So we have choices to make. And that the premature death in cities is going to increase depending on the amount of warming. So I just wanna just get close to the end here and say that much of this has a historical point. The red lining from the 1930s put black and brown and poor people in the worst neighborhoods that might often flood. We now know is that these are the warmest areas on the city level. Less trees, more asphalt, and so they're warmer. And as the climate warms, these areas are also gonna warm faster. And we find in this New York Times article that's across most of the cities. So this is something very systemic within the United States. And it is likely to get worse unless there are some adaptation strategies. I just wanna kind of end this out talking about EJ on the continent because this is completely missed. But pollution is very big in Africa and often not monitored. Whether it's massively grown urban cities, biomass burning, dust storms, or waste sites, it is exposing many people. And we also have indoor pollution. It's exposing many people to unhealthy air quality. And what we know is that right now, some 300,000 and 700,000 and 708,000 people die each year from pollution. And we also think it drives infant mortality here by up to 40%, the pollution, the particulate matter. So this is a kind of a parallel issue that's going on on the continent. And I might say that we just are too far behind. We don't have good monitoring, prediction. We have poor communication to the public and we don't know the health linkages and we don't how, know how to reduce it. So there's a lot of work that needs to happen on the continent just around the ability to breathe clean air. I might say for the last three years, we've been trying to build a network of air quality monitors in Africa. It has been hard work. There was very few monitors out there when we started in 2019, but we've been building, so we built good networks in Nigeria, and more recently in Angola, Namibia, because we believe that like fundamentally, people need to know the level of air quality that they're breathing. And it's just not possible today on the continent to a large extent. All right, I think I'm near the end here. I believe that we can address climate justice issues by adopting some of the 17 EJ principles. The principle number one is the earth is a sacred place. We should be respecting it and we should be leaving something for future generations. We can't use it all. We can't buy it all. We need to save some. We need to have representation at the table and people are going to need protection from climate change, including reparations. I'm gonna, uh, try to go past here. And so just ending this out, here's what I think about climate solutions. This is the work that's, that we have to deal with today. We need more monitoring in Africa. We got to mitigate. We need adaptation strategies for all the vulnerable people in the world, including the United States. People need some kind of reparations to deal with climate change. Those people need to be sitting at the table. If we don't deal with the social and environmental injustice in the US abroad, 
we can't deal with climate justice. Some good things are happening like engaging black, brown, indigenous and underserved youth in climate justice. So the climate course that's been proposed by the Build Back Better plan would be a great thing. And we have to invest in underserved communities. And I know that was a lot and I was moving quickly, but I just wanted to give you a, just a slice of my thoughts that cross my brain on a typical day. I feel hopeless most of the time, but I know a lot of good people who are out there trying to make a difference. So thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for giving us the scientific research, the um, personal experience and story that you shared and um, giving us um, just the perspective of your research and time in the African diaspora, reminding us that this is a historical problem um, that did not just happen right now, but there are so many layers of exploitation and history that needs to be addressed in order to build a more equitable and just future for all. Um, the layers of social justice, environmental justice, and climate justice, those intersections, you did such a good job of just bringing them all together. And you answered a lot of the questions that people were um, asking during your presentation. So thanks for just naturally flowing through it. Um, but when it comes to the science, um, uh, one person was asking about the uh, impact of um, science technology solutions such as wind tri uh, wind um, yes. Yes, uh, yes, wind power and solar power. So what impacts do those uh, tools of science have for us in addressing the vast climate um, change that is happening right now? I'm glad you asked that because the truth is, is that there are very small percentage of the energy portfolio and they have to be incentivized and I think that's part of the Build Back Better plan is that we need to incentivize solar and electric vehicles because there's a multiplier effect in terms of communities being safer, in terms of particulate matter, but also reducing this. But at present, we do not have enough technology to reduce the amount of carbon emissions. We're hoping that some geniuses will come, but this is going to be tough because carbon taxes are probably the most obvious way. But, you know, no one wants to hear this word tax. But unfortunately, we are taxing the future, the, those who are not yet born and those who are currently dealing with it. So we're paying a low price for the carbon that we use every day without taking into consideration the other aspects. So I hope over the next 20, 30 years, there's technology, but we basically have to mitigate. Uh, thank you for sharing some of the um, environmental justice principles that you really um, honed into as like solutions for us. Are there any like global um, networks or compacts that you know of that are um, pushing um, science-driven solutions that you would like to acknowledge or uplift? Um, for me, I see a lot of youth groups out there and I'm always behind them. But I also think like the innovation hubs, they're quite informal, are important for getting, I feel like young people engaged and trying to figure out solutions to this much bigger problem. But at the local level, where you can see the work, people see, oh, they're creating new things or they're using uh, inexpensive greenhouse, greenhouses to grow food for the local community 
or so all of those things are super important. I think at every level, wherever we see it, we ought to applaud it and then support it. Thank you. And then when you, we spent a lot of time addressing how frontline communities continue to be exploited and um, most they're the most vulnerable and impacted by climate disruption. So in the case of like climate emergent um, scenarios like floods or catastrophe that happens right now, what ways can we support um, those frontline communities when they're directly impacted by climate catastrophe? How can we be a better support um, in times of emergency? I wish I knew the answer to this because, I mean, when we see the disasters happen, we need helping hands. The only problem is, is that without mitigating greenhouse gases, they will increase in intensity. And so we're doing like kind of patchwork, but the truth is, is that we need policy. So we need policymakers who are committed to preserving the planet that we live on. And that is happening at the, uh, the voting polls. <laughs> it's where, that's really where it's at. Yeah, thank you for reminding us like the importance of local action and reparations and how those connect to um, just um, continued equity and environmental justice movements. Um, we're gonna segue to the end of our presentation. So thank you for um, the engagement from our participate, participants and um, your presentation today. Okay, you're welcome. And uh, thank you for inviting me. <laughs> Thanks, Katie, for leading the Q&A session. And again, a sincere thank you to Professor Jenkins. You provided for us such an in-depth and broadly the intersection of climate change, social justice, and environmental justice. And I'm very glad that we recorded this webinar because I and I'm sure others will be revisiting it over and over. Um, and also, thank you for your work. Um, I know that you mentioned that sometimes it, it makes you a bit sad uh, seeing all the data, um, but knowing the work that you are doing, your scholarship and your activism, it actually gives me hope. And so thank you so much for all of your work. Um, a few announcements before we close today. Uh, please consider contacting your Senator uh, to act now for climate justice. Um, right now, decisions are being made about priorities included in the budget reconciliation bill or the Build Back Better plan. Um, Dr. Jenkins mentioned Climate Corps as being part of that, um, as well as the appropriations for fiscal year 2022. Um, both bills can make significant changes, um, progress in addressing climate change in the US and around the world. Um, you can do so now by picking up your phone and scanning the QR code on the screen, and that will take you directly to our action page. Um, we offer these educational resources, not just to have knowledge, but we educate to advocate. So we hope that you will act um, with us. This webinar is the third in this series uh, with the fourth this afternoon with Dr. Kelsey Leonard, who will be speaking on indigenous climate and water justice. If you haven't registered for upcoming webinars, please use the QR code on this slide and that will take you directly to the registration page. Thank you again to Professor Jenkins and thank you all for joining us today. Have a great day. Thank you.